Okay, very good morning to you. It is Tuesday the 19th of May. Hope you're doing well. Uh, first of all, my name is Anthony Chung. I'm the Head of Market Analysis here at Amplify Trading. Uh, if you're interested in anything we do from the proprietary trading to the traded development programs to our student internships uh, that we run, just check out AmplifyTrading.com and remember to like and subscribe to the channel. Um, this is our website here as you can see and you can navigate down and see the appropriate sections uh, whatever your interest might be. Uh, but let's just go straight into the charts and the briefing for this morning. And yeah, a, a positive day yesterday. Um, a kind of optimism on economies perhaps reopening sooner than perhaps some had anticipated. No real huge signs of a, a significant second wave as yet. Uh, but still obviously monitoring that situation very closely. And then that kind of early results for an experimental vaccine uh, Moderna vaccine testing showing immune system responses in humans uh, just helping just lift things yesterday and and just having a look this morning not a great deal of new information has happened there's some interesting comments about a joint uh, EU fund uh, backstopped by predominantly Germany and France that, that's definitely something that's been we've been awaiting for quite a while uh, so that has happened but otherwise not too much so it's kind of more a little bit of a continuation if you like from yesterday um, Asia Pacific session was generally positive following the the positive session on Wall Street, uh, and that's kind of fed through, and we've we've basically stabilised and held those gains thus far. So, uh, equity index futures, the DAX, I can see here on the left centre, it's just creeping up to retest around the highs that we saw uh, going into the the late U.S. session. So the futures did continue to rally as we went into the close on Wall Street, and we're just testing that now on the DAX. Uh, U.S. indices moderately positive. So gold, again, don't look at the fact that on the session change, uh, it's pretty much flat up to $2. Generally speaking, though, it's held what was a substantial move lower yesterday, which I don't think comes as too much of a surprise, just given some of the recent run up in price in which we've had. Uh, but T-Note, similarly, uh, similar type price movement up five ticks, but finding some resistance at pivot in the futures overnight uh, and is still down. Uh, quite significantly from yesterday's session, given the renewed kind of optimism. For crude oil, it's pretty uninteresting at the moment. Um, it's just kind of just above its pivot level, trading a 32 handle, so definitely is not seeing and is not expected to see any type of same degree of volatility as we go into that uh, June future expiration later today. Uh, and then in the currency markets, there, there's a continuation of dollar weakness. Dixie down about two tenths. I mean, there has been some UK data out earlier this morning, um, which we can talk about now, actually. Uh, well, let's just have a quick look. Um, here's Cable looking on a on a 60 minute candlestick. And you can see here, we've just had a bit of a breakout in price activity over the course of the morning. Uh, you have had the latest employment change data. So not unemployment, employment change came in at 211,000. Against expectations of 50,000, but don't forget this is for the month of March, so it is a little bit backward looking. Um, we have also had some other commentary coming out alongside that this morning. I know this looks very busy, but it's kind of bottom up is the priority of the headlines. And UK International Trade Secretary Truss has been out this morning and basically unveiled new proposed global tariffs that will benefit UK consumers and households. One of the main ones here is that the UK removing tariffs on 30 billion pounds worth of imports from entering UK supply chains. So perhaps that getting a little bit of a look in uh, as well, just given some of the renewed Brexit uncertainty that was circulating on the risks um, from those penultimate deal making discussions that came to an abrupt kind of close last week without no real definitive movement. Uh, so cable has broken above uh, this area here of the high that was seen uh, around the, the fix yesterday. And so we pushed up and we've kind of found the next logical point of resistance. You can see here um, quite a strong level in the futures at least at 122.45. Um, this trend line as well, the, the pound finding quite a nice uh, bounce off that trend line that's been in play really since the eighth multiple tests. Uh, and it came back down to test that quite nice before this push up that we've had. Uh, any further appreciation here and, and largely led by 
the dollar as well as as it continues to weaken at this point then I'll probably be looking on a further push up towards R1 just above there starts to bring that seventh low and some of that consolidation of the price on the 13th so be targeting these kind of levels up here if we if we continue this move um, similarly in the the euro obviously benefiting from some of the dollar movement uh, I was just looking at the euro on a bit of a longer time frame this is a 90 minute candlestick uh, and I was really looking at the the range that we'd predominantly been in throughout the month of May, which had been defined by this kind of area down here, I've got with the the rectangles on the the bottom and upper uh, levels of really 107, kind of 80 up to just shy of the 109 handle. We've broken above there this morning, and so had a bit of a test uh, already, which was up at around that uh, high that was seen on the morning of the fifth. It's just looking to push on now from above that point. If we do be looking to target up and around those highs that were seen on the 1st of May, uh, they would come in about 15 or so pips above the current price. Uh, so definitely things livening up a little bit in the in the pairs. Uh, and the sterling movement, of course, coming you know, where we are at the moment in a reversal of, of basically this price movement that we've had of you know, continuation of talks about negative rates. We had Andy Haldane, of course, over the weekend talking about um, the Bank of England are exploring all the options available, and that does include then things like negative interest rates as well as other um, unconventional measures in terms of tweaking their existing QE program. But then you've had Tenreiro, you probably read another MPC member yesterday evening talking about quite favorably the impacts that the negative rates have had uh, in the Eurozone. And so definitely intonating towards being open to that idea. But I think a lot of that's just being brushed aside for the moment. And uh, I think I wouldn't read too much into those comments uh, at this point. Uh, I think it's probably logical central banking to be able to have all options on the table. Uh, but at the moment, yeah, some, some nice movement in the currency pairs. Yeah, And then that equity move yesterday, I mean, certainly for one, uh, it caught me by a bit of surprise um, how persistent uh, the buying was. I'm just going to remove my my camera feed for a second so you can see everything. Because I've got this kind of running chart, which you've seen many times, uh, that I've been annotating as we've been going along. And yeah, I got, got caught a little bit blindsided. I thought the market naturally would find a pretty strong area of resistance. I know Sam was in the long and, and I think he closed out his position on that trend line. So look, let's not let's not detract from the point that that's an excellent trade you know from the morning breaking out of some of that previous area of, of kind of technical support and resistance that we've had the market sprung up you had the kind of Powell suggesting that he's got additional ammo at the weekend and that CBS interview uh, corona cases easing reopening beginning then you had the positive vaccine drug news and that really gave it a shot in the arm as the US came in on the crossover but then we got to that trend line from the the 30th the retest on the 11th and you can see a lot of people were eyeing that up because uh, the price had a period of consolidation but then just pushed up higher again through the open on wall street uh, up to those highs that were seen on the 11th and we eventually did and pretty much literally to the tick tested 65 there you can see that was the april 30th high and then the market just faded after that point uh, just going into the close so it's quite interesting just the general behavior of this market at the moment you can see that last half an hour hour worth of price action on wall street does tend to be quite interesting it'll push up hits that target and then just absolutely fades into the close albeit still a, a very strong up day uh, and so here we are just consolidating now really around this area um, interesting to see where we go today you know the market well we'll look over the calendar there certainly is a few other positive developments to uh, particularly on the European side uh, which I'm going to discuss now as we go through the news so interested to see whether we can kick on from here um, and let's just go into then some of the headlines so first things first let's have a talk about these two guys and this comes as Jerome Powell um, is due to speak on well a virtual hearing before the Senate Banking Committee uh, this is one of his regular appearances who will be featuring alongside this chap, Stephen Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary. And today's the day when they basically get grilled by um, the senators about how they're dealing with the pandemic response. 
both from a monetary policy and a fiscal policy side of things. Now, this event, I think it kicks off at 3 p.m. London time, uh, so t 10 o'clock Eastern, and it's very much a political-driven uh, event. It doesn't really move markets a great deal. It's not a platform where typically power would come out and say something spectacularly new, um, and it goes on for a particularly long period of time. It tends to be a little bit more politicians trying to you know, manage their own agenda of just being quite critical of what they're doing, what could they do, bet, what have done better. It doesn't really um, produce anything of new uh, perspective on where monetary policy might go going forward. Second to that, the actual comments have already come out. The statement last night was released in terms of his, his kind of prepared text. Uh, and Powell basically said the central bank is prepared to use its full range of tools and leave the benchmark lending rate near zero until the economy is back on track. Uh, but again, it's that kind of full range of tools. They've got more ammunition. This just kind of alleviated perhaps a little bit of market concern that the Fed might have been running out of bullets uh, to some respect. So I guess that's the, the comments coming out. The backstopping of Powell continuing to say that they've got lots of options. Economies reopening. Um, the experimental vaccine, albeit I think the markets has overshot that a little bit on that particular um, piece of information, have all been positive catalysts in the short term. This is that European story though that I was referring to and this is talking about Merkel finally coming through um, alongside the French president agreeing to a support package of 500 billion euros uh, to assist the European Union in their recovery from the, the coronavirus pandemic. Now, this, is, this has been such a, a contested issue. Uh, obviously, when it comes to formulating a package of this degree, Germany is the one that needs to contribute typically the most. And the biggest beneficiary, of course, tends to be countries then like Italy. And on that note, let me just bring in a shot of the BTP futures, which is the Italian bond market. Um, let me just switch over here. Let me just put my camera back on. So here I'm looking at BTP futures and they've, you know, let me just quickly put it back on a 30 minute just so you can see the, the kind of the aggressiveness of the bid that we saw yesterday as some of this information was coming out late in the afternoon. You know, and then if we look back, totally, you know, big breakout of some technical relevant areas here for the BTP uh, from those highs that have been restricting a lot of the price through much of the uh, month of May and then certainly taking out that late April, May high now to where we are at the moment. And they continue to push higher this morning on the back of some of these latest comments. Probably that area now where we're testing uh, is quite key. And then those previous highs that were seen back up in on the 9th of April as a target perhaps. Um, so we're already trading up nearly two points in the BTP future um, this morning. So again, what exactly is this? Well, Crucially, Merkel said bonds issued by the European Commission would be repaid from the EU budget, um, the lion's share of which, of course, as I said, comes from Germany. Um, Italian bonds then, that rise, the biggest jump that we've seen since March. Uh, and why is it so meaningful for Italy? Well, the EU Commission projects that Italy's uh, public debt will be close to 160% of GDP uh, by the end of this year. So they're the ones, of course, that that will benefit the most by being backstopped by predominantly Germany uh, in this case. Uh, and obviously the Germans have been very resistant to the idea of this going through, but the fact that now they're now coming together uh, would be seen as a positive for the economic recovery in the euro area, or at least it gives some degree of, of certainty about having enough funds there to, uh, to help the recovery. Um, it's not exactly a done deal though, the final deal uh, needs to, the backing of all 27 members. Austria has been one um, that signalled immediately that it remains opposed to the direct handouts, um, as they term it, to some of these other Southern European nations. Um, however, now Germany is on board, kind of think that um, the, the deal would go through in that respect. Um, the other thing this is leading to then is, you know, what's Christine Lagarde saying, uh, the head of the ECB? And this is the headline. She said QE to continue despite the German court ruling. Obviously, this was quite a hot topic about two weeks ago when that German constitutional court uh, passed a hearing uh, or some uh, an investigation into has the ECB got the appropriate right to be able to um, kind of fund, if you like, other sovereign states by purchasing their bonds. Um, but 
as largely expected, Christine Lagarde saying, look, we're just going to continue on as we see fit. Um, and so I don't think that comes as a great surprise, but if you think about it, you know, Europe, Europe finally getting their act together in a coordinated fiscal response of a large degree led by Germany, which is very important. And then Christine Lagarde continuing to say that monetary policy is also going to continue its, its period of expansion. So these kind of dual forces, I, I guess, in combination with now heading very slowly and cautiously into reopening is, is what's being perceived as quite a positive. Elsewhere, Trump threatens the WHO with permanent cutoff of US funds. Um, yeah, I mean, this is just the latest, I think, in the uh, the kind of rhetoric. Um, if, it's, if he's not blaming China for the origination of the virus, well, then he's blaming the World Health Organization for their handling of it and the fact that they uh, must demonstrate independence from China. Um, I don't think this is really uh, a big deal, but I just wanted to point it out because I think it very much fits into that distractive tactic deployed by the administration in order that they know to take some of the political heat off of Trump going into this uh, campaign period. Uh, I don't think I wouldn't read any more than that into this type of headline. The other thing, though, that has come out uh, is this was quite interesting. It came out on Reuters was that the Nasdaq are set to unveil new rules on initial public offerings. Essentially, what it means is it's going to make it more difficult for Chinese companies to list on the exchange. Now, why? Well, the main point here is that the Nasdaq plans to set a fundraising limit of $25 million, and most of the Chinese IPOs come in lower than that level. Uh, so that would be a real hindrance to them. So it's kind of, um, you know, this isn't the Nasdaq consciously looking to go about that, but certainly... You know, all of these forces behind the scenes will be talking and this is another kind of prod, if you like, in that ongoing trade war um, that we need to continue to monitor. Other news that I've seen this morning, um, it hasn't really impacted the Aussie, but there has been continuation of perhaps some, some uh, further stress in the relationship between China and Australia and obviously that's a critical one uh, as a trade partner for the Aussies. Um, Australian exports of wine, seafood, oatmeal, fruit, and dairy are in danger of being targeted by China um, if Beijing decides to escalate a row over the calls for an investigation to the origin of COVID-19, according to those familiar with the matter. So, yeah, it's something worth just keeping an eye on here. Uh, as I looked at with that uh, Economic Observatory website a few sessions ago, you know, definitely I'd say do your due diligence work out what is the most exposed products where um, that Australia could be impacted by further kind of restrictions of, uh, of importing by China on, on certain products. But for the moment, the Aussie is pretty happy with life. Uh, we did have the RBA minutes uh, that stated that the package has been introduced only recently. Of, of course, they've done multiple rate cuts uh, in recent months. Um, their members assessed the best course of action was to maintain current policy setting and monitor economic and financial outcomes closely. And so, yeah, status quo, I guess, and, and the Aussie for the moment, just feeling the benefit of a little bit of a continuation and weakening of the dollar, and uh, just coming up to test the Asia Pacific high in the R1 and the Aussie futures. Um, otherwise, for the, for the session ahead, this is what the calendar looks like. So we've already had the RBA minutes and the, the UK data. Um, the German ZEW, Economic sentiment comes out a bit later, this is for the month of May, and if anything, we are actually looking for a mild improvement, um, albeit a significantly large range. How important will that data be? Uh, I'm not so sure. I don't think a great deal, to be honest, but worth keeping an eye on. That'll be at 10 o'clock. Uh, the ZEW, for those unfamiliar with it, is the economists and analysts' kind of expectation about current and future uh, expectations. And then it's US session. You've got some housing data, building permits, housing starts. You've got the weekly API crude numbers. Uh, and then, as, as mentioned, you've got Jerome Powell testifying before the Senate Banking Committee uh, on the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Stim um, Security Act alongside the Treasury Secretary, Steve Mnuchin. Um, separately, Fed's Kashkari, a well-known dove on the Fed, is speaking on the economy at the same time. So 3 o'clock London, 10 Eastern. Uh, and it would be particularly interesting, given his general disposition of being quite a far-reaching dove, what he has to say about negative interest rates. So just keep an eye out on that. 
Um, you've got Fed's Rosengren non-voter speaking at 7 p.m. Um, Earnings-wise, there are two names just to have half an eye on. You've got the brick and mortar kind of champions, if you like, in America, Walmart and Home Depot, both reporting at 11 o'clock this morning. So pre-market open, Walmart EPS expected 112, Home Depot at 227. Um, so if you need these numbers, again, just take a, a screenshot here. I'll, I'll, I'll put these in the chat room as well, so you've got them to hand. Uh, but that is it from me. So any comments, please feel free to, to leave uh, a comment on the video. I'll be happy to respond. Otherwise, I wish you guys a good day ahead. I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks very much.